All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I want to say a huge thank you to all our classes for joining us today. Again, through September, October, it's been a really weird school year, so we really appreciate you tuning in as we continue to highlight amazing scientists and explorers from around the globe. So if you've been keeping track, if you've been watching on YouTube coming in live, you will know that one of our biggest partnerships of 2020 has been with the Duke Lemur Center. We've been doing all sorts of amazing stuff with them from finding fossils and digging them up. We've gone to the lemur forest and seen Zabumafu leaping around. We've done all sorts of cool things highlighting some of their work in Madagascar and beyond. But today we're doing something a little bit different. We are joined by education technician at the Duke Lemur Center, Anna Lee, and she's going to talk about field work, getting out, looking at primates. So we're primates ourselves. We're going to learn a little bit more about that. And we can learn a lot by studying some of the other amazing primates throughout in the world. So we're going to talk about the work at the Duke Lemur Center, some of their videos and pictures of some of the stuff they've done, and her own work in Kenya studying and observing baboons. So without further ado, and not to steal any more of her thunder, thank you so, so much for joining us, Anna, and take us away. Thanks for having me, Jesse. So yes, we are going through um, the primate family tree here a little bit. So talking about observational research, that is research that you can do without hurting or manipulating the animals at all. And we'll be looking at examples with wild baboons in Amboseli National Park, Kenya, and then also the work at the Duke Lemur Center. So as an explanation of that, that is just because that's how my own career has unfolded. So I started out with lemurs. I went to Duke University. I was a work study, so um, part-time employee at the Duke Lemur Center doing tours, doing educational programming there, and then kind of getting exposed to research at the Lemur Center. There are classes you can take. There are different ways to get um, involved with research there a little bit. And then my senior year of school, I wanted to do a little bit more research, got involved with the Amboseli Baboon Research Project uh, on the ground in Duke at Duke University. And then after I graduated, was able to go to Amboseli, Kenya, and do some research over there. So I was a research assistant with the project um, studying wild baboons. My time there ended in December. And then when I came back, I got a job at the Duke Lemur Center again. So that's why I am um, kind of talking about both just because that's where my experience comes from. While I was over in Kenya, my project was photo based. So I had a very nice research camera, was able to take lots and lots of pictures for science. But when you have a camera and you can't always take pictures that you need for science, you can take pictures of a lot of other animals and a lot of other things happening as well. So all of the photos and videos you'll see from the field in Kenya were photos and videos that I was taking during my time there doing the research. So let's get started with primate research in general with that big question of why do we study primates? Well, like Jesse was mentioning, humans are primates too. So we have a lot of characteristics in common with our primate friends and relatives here. We have grasping hands. Primates also have fingernails at the tops of their fingers you'll see in these pictures and uh, other characteristics that we have in common with them. So when we study primates, when we study wild primates, we can learn a lot about humans, human health, the way humans interact with each other and all of those other questions of evolution along that family tree. Primates are also endangered in the wild. With lemurs, for example, about 94% of them are endangered or threatened with extinction. So it's a really, really important time. We want to learn as much as we possibly can while there are still nice, healthy populations in the wild. We don't know how long we'll have those animals in some cases. So we want to learn as much as we can about them while we still have them. That also helps us protect them in human care. So at the Duke Lemur Center, we have animals who are living in human care. They have medical care, they have, um, they're fed every day, they're taken well care of, but we wanna make sure that we are doing what we need to for them. So we can study the wild animals, see how much space they need, see what their family groups look like, see um, their social interactions, see what they're eating. And that way, when we have them in human care, we know what, how to meet those needs. You can study primates everywhere that you can see primates. So starting off in human care at different zoos and facilities like the Duke Lemur Center, we have animals, like I mentioned, in enclosures, we have animals in human care. So they're getting vet care, they're getting food, and there is some non-invasive um, non observational research happening. So the animals are there, researchers, students can come in and see what they're doing, how they're interacting with enrichment or those play objects they get throughout the day just to make sure they're staying nice and healthy, see what they're eating, see what their food preferences might be, and doing all of that nice hands-off observation-based research. 
You can also study primates in a little bit more of a wild setting. The Duke Lemur Center has done quite a few of these Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants videos from the natural habitat enclosures around the Lemur Center. Those are really big, open, forested enclosures. There are fence lines around them, but when you're actually in them, there is no barrier between you and the animals. So the animals are interacting with their forest, just like they would if they were out in the wild, if they were in Madagascar in this case. They're climbing the trees, they're foraging, they get food every day, they get a nice breakfast treat. That means they all come to that one central spot so we can take a look at everybody, make sure everyone's staying nice and healthy, but then the rest of the day they can distribute throughout the, throughout the forest. So we have a picture here on the left with those red rough lemurs and an observer. And then on the right, we have an observation happening from this summer. So you can see those nice masks when we're in those animal areas. That's Dr. Lydia Green. She's done a few of these talks and we'll talk a little bit more about her research as we get going here because she's done some really cool observation-based research at the Lemur Center really recently. Finally, you can study primates actually in the wild where those primates live. So that's a picture of me around this time last year. These are animals who have been studied for a really long time. So the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project has been happening since 1971. That is well before any of these animals in the picture were born. So when they were born into these social groups, they had observers with them pretty much from the beginning. So they're really used to being observed. They're used to those select people coming in, watching them behave throughout their day. They're not interacting with them at all. They're not interested in us at all. Um, and they are still really skittish around strangers, around new situations. They are definitely wild primates. These are primates that aren't getting taken care of at all. We're not feeding them. We're not doing checkups with them. They are completely self-sufficient, completely wild animals, but they are habituated to researchers. So if these are animals who had never been around people, there's no way I would be able to stand in an open field with them being so comfortable foraging and playing around me. These field sites are happening pretty much all over the world where you can find lemurs. So these circles are indicators of where papers have been published featuring primates. So you see primate research happening a lot in Madagascar, obviously, since that's where all those lemurs are, lots of circles in there. But then if you look at the rest of the map, pretty much anywhere you can find primates, you can find people doing primate research, whether that's in a more human care situation, whether that's in the field, or whether that's somewhere in between with animals who are used to people who are habituated to humans, but don't necessarily have that level of care that they would if they were in a zoo or other research facility. So we will pause there. Just kidding. I forget my own slides sometimes. We're gonna talk a little bit more um, and then we'll come back for questions there. But figuring out how you actually study primates, once you find them, once you find a good place, you can do research with them. What questions can you possibly ask? So these are all examples at the Lemur Center over the years of asking questions that involve things like what can lemurs do? So what are they capable of both physically? They have grasping hands, but they work a little bit differently. They have more like mittens, so they don't have the same dexterity that we do as humans. We can touch our thumbs to our fingers in a way that they can't. And we also wanna look at their cognition. So what is happening in their brains? What kind of decisions are they capable of making? And you can do that with puzzles. So they are puzzle feeders here in the forest examples. There is a food reward in there and the lemur has to solve some sort of task to open up, to slide, to get to those pieces. In the middle, we have an example of a color vision study. So color vision is really interesting. A lot of animals can't differentiate between red or green. So in this example, we have a lemur who will get a food reward every time she touches the right color square. So if we ask her to find the red square, every time she touches that red square, she'll get a food reward. These are animals who have grown up in human care. They're used to seeing novel objects like these touch screens, like these puzzles, and there is some positive reinforcement training that goes into getting them used to these devices. So we're not just springing them on them and then asking them to do a task. We are giving them a food reward every time they positively associate with the box itself. So if they come up and sniff it, they might get a treat. Over time, we can build that up with positive reinforcement to the point where we can actually ask them to do the task. These are processes that can be pretty slow, can be a lot of gradual learning with the lemurs that goes on, and not something that you would be able to do if you had a wild primate. Those wild primates wouldn't know necessarily about positive reinforcement training. They wouldn't have those relationships going with their researchers or the technicians who are getting them trained with these behaviors. So if you're interested in questions about cognition or what animals are capable of doing, then you wanna use research that's a little bit less observational and a little bit more hands-on. 
We also have a lot of lab work that's happening. So I mentioned Lydia was doing field work. Here she is working with Marino Blanco, who is also a postdoc at the Duke Lemur Center. They are doing work in the labs here at Duke University on the right, but then also doing similar lab work over in Madagascar. This is combined with field work. So a lot of times these different research methods are all tangled up with one another. You wanna answer questions, but you wanna answer questions as well as you can. So if you're interested in health, you might be looking at the genetic material or the actual um, health of those animals combined with what they're doing, what they're how they're behaving, what they're eating, what they're doing in the field. So lots of different research methods working together here um, to answer bigger, broader questions than you would be able to answer with just observation alone. That being said, observation alone is a valuable research tool. Here we have an example of observational research happening at the lemur center on the right with those nice distinctive ring-tailed lemurs and then on the left in Ambicelli. The um, human in the image is Chelsea Southworth, who is another research assistant who is in the field at the same time I was. She's in a couple more of these photos. Since I had the camera, she got to be featured in a lot of those pictures. But observation-based research is research that's happening when you're not manipulating or hurting the animals in any way. You're not interacting with them directly. You're standing at a safe distance with a tablet or a pencil or a pen writing down the behaviors that you're seeing. So that might be writing down behaviors every time you see it. So if there's a fight between two animals, you might jot that down. Or you might just be recording about every minute or so saying, okay, this is an individual animal I'm watching. Right now they're eating. Right now they're playing. Right now they're resting. And over the course of your day, you can get a pretty good idea of what the animal's lives are looking like, even without touching or manipulating the animals in any way. So this is actually our question break. If we have anybody in any of the classes who's interested in primate research or why we study primates or what sort of research questions we can answer by different methods. Very cool, Anna, that's fantastic. And what a cool picture with a really exciting thumb there going on. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave it to our classes for a second. You guys can, all our teachers can ask their classes if they have a question ready. We're gonna do one round of questions now. I'm gonna start us off with one that I've noticed as we've been doing these Duke Lemur Center presentations, and that is about naming the animals. So you guys have names for animals at the center when they're jumping around. Do you name animals when you're in the wild doing an observation? Do you number them? This is something that we've heard a lot of different opinions on over our years here at Exploring by the City of Your Pants. Yeah, all of the baboons that you'll see in these pictures do have names. Um, in the next slides here, the names are actually on there. And all of the animals are named distinctly. So their first three letters of their names are unique across the entire population. This has been happening for 40 years. So there are thousands of names that have already been used, those three letter codes. But every time a new baby is born, they are named based on their mother's name. So that first letter, if your mom's name started with an E, your name's gonna start with an E, but those next two letters have to be unique. So lots of different naming rules, but it is a really fun activity to sit around when you have a new baby pouring through the old name books, figuring out what distinct, unique name that they can get. That helps us talk about the animals in a really unique way. So if you have an example or a story of an animal, everybody knows who you're talking about. And that also, when you're looking at a big group, helps you identify individuals. Fantastic, thanks, Anna. All right, uh, let's go to Ms. Bergeron's class in Stafford Springs, Connecticut, if they've got a first question for us. Come on in, guys. Um, why do we study them? Yeah, we study them to help us learn about ourselves. So primates are really, really interesting. Primates are like us in some ways. And we want to also know what makes us so special as humans. So asking them to solve those puzzles. If you were given a puzzle like that with a nice food reward, maybe a piece of candy, you would be able to solve it no problem. But we're looking at lemurs who maybe can't do the same things we can, maybe can't see those little latches to unlock, and maybe not as interested in the food reward on the inside. So helping us learn about ourselves and helping the animals um, helping us protect them in the wild. Very important. Yeah. Joe just sends me boxes of cookies. That's why I do this job. So food rewards are very, very effective. Um, exactly. Ms. Basalto's class joining us in Miami, Florida. If you guys have a question for us, come on up. Just demute your mic and you're good to go. Uh, there you there go. Then you can hear me now. Thank you so much. We're having such a, yeah. such a great time. My class is really excited about this and we have a lot of questions, but one of the questions is, how does um, the climate change affect them and how big do they get? And if, when they get sick, what do you treat them with? What do you give them when they're sick? 
All right, so starting off with your last question there, these are wild animals. So when they get sick, nothing happens. They are e either able to heal naturally in the wild or they unfortunately pass away. But that's something that happens in the wild and that's something that we don't modify when we're out there watching them. As far as how big they get, that was actually the question that my research was trying to answer. So you'll see in a few of our pictures that there are nice laser dots on the animals themselves with the camera. And that was a way that we could use a scale to measure them. So overall, most of the females are about 40 centimeters or so. So not very big, about the size of a small dog in most cases with these baboons. And then your final question on climate change. Climate change is still a question that we're trying to figure out exactly how it's gonna affect the animals. So they are very seasonally dependent animals. There's a wet season and a dry season in most of these tropical regions where primates live and climate change is sort of uh, messing with those lines of where the wet season is, where the dry season is. So that will be a process that will keep unfolding. And with these long-term research studies, we should be able to answer that question a little bit more distinctly here in the future as things keep changing. Uh, Anna, you are an extremely efficient question answer. Uh, for our class that might not know that, you're whipping through these. This is great. Um, great questions on YouTube, too, and a, a welcome to some of our teachers joining there. Uh, let's go to Mr. Bocci's class joining us in Toronto for one question, and then we'll wrap up with Ms. Adams before we continue on with the presentation. So, Mr. Bocci, come on in. Go for it. Hi. Hi, Anna. Um, Graydon in my class is wondering, how many lemur species have you seen? So I haven't been to Madagascar to see them in the wild. So I've only ever seen the lemurs at the Duke Lemur Center. So we have about 15 different species there, um, ranging from our teeny little mouse lemurs to those big cockerel shafak. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Mr. Pocket. All right, let's go to Mechanicsville, Virginia for Ms. Adams' class. If you guys have a question, come on up. Yeah. How much food does a lemur eat in a day, if you didn't catch that, Anna? Uh, lemurs eat plenty of food. So it depends on the animal. Usually they're getting around um, a cup or so of those dry primate biscuits and then a nice cup of fruits and veggies as well. So sometimes family groups won't share equally. So maybe that dominant female might eat a little bit more than her uh, less dominant friends or family members in that social group, but usually around a cup or two of food a day. Fantastic, guys. Well, great round of first questions from all our classes. Get those questions ready for the next round, too, and we're done the whole presentation. And for everyone on YouTube, share your questions in the chat bar. We'll take as many as we can when we wrap up. But for now, we'll turn it back to Anna to continue blowing our minds with some really cool pictures and videos. Let's do it. All right. So after you decide what sort of questions you're going to answer with these animals doing observational research, you have to then find them. Finding the animals can be a little bit more tricky, especially when you're out on the African savanna and those animals can be pretty much anywhere, but that's even hard at the Duke Lemur Center. You'll see in a lot of photos and videos, both at the Lemur Center and in the field, a lot of animals that are involved in research projects are wearing tracking collars. So maybe one or few individuals in a social group will wear a collar that has a radio signal and might have an antenna or another device, and it em emits a nice beeping noise throughout the day that you can hear when you're using these big antenna. This is a process that takes some practice. So here are some uh, technicians at the Lemur Center practicing with that, going around in those different directions, listening for those beeps. Those beeps get closer together when you're pointing the direction of the animal, but it's not very precise and it's not telling you, okay, go 10 meters this direction, look up 10 feet and there is the animal. So you have to get really used to that. You have to practice that. That's important for research. Obviously you can't do any research until you find the animals in question but it's also really important for the health of the animals. So these are technicians, these are animal keepers who wanna make sure that every day they're finding all of the animals in their section. If they're not coming down for breakfast, that might mean an animal is trapped somewhere or hurt, or it might just mean that they found a nice tasty grape patch and don't wanna leave their forest fruits behind to come for some dry biscuits. So it depends on where the animal is, but usually you can see them visually and if you can't, they have those radio tracking collars that they can use then to help us find the animal. After you find the animal, you have to figure out who is who. And that can be a really difficult process. So we were talking a little bit about baboon names. You can see them written down. These are two sisters, Telly and Tibe, and they have the same first letter of their name, which means they're in the same family group. But in my opinion, they look really, really similar. So if I needed to take pictures of one of them, I needed to know who was who with these sisters. This is a good way to use the radio collars to kind of cheat a little bit. 
One is more distinctive, obviously, because she has that tracking collar on. So those tracking collars are really, really helpful when you're looking for animals, of course, to find that signal, but also when you want to identify otherwise really similar looking animals. It's also possible to identify animals when they don't have a tracking collar. So Eclipse here on the left does happen to have a collar, but she's also a really distinctive baboon, even if she didn't have that collar. She has a really dark color that's not as common in the rest of her group, and she also has a curve in her tail that the other animals don't have. On the other side, you have a baboon who's really light in color, and she's also pretty distinctive in her social group. So even without those major characteristics like a tracking collar or a bent tail, you can help to use these little clues. Of course, that's really difficult, especially if you're not in the field for a very long time. So we have experts who are there with us. So these are observers who are in the field full time. That's their full time job. And in many cases, they've been there from the beginning of these animals lives. So they've watched them grow up and they know what they look like across the entire population. These are There are hundreds of baboons there and they know what they all look like. So if I ever needed to find a specific individual or wasn't seeing her, or didn't quite know what she looked like, you can always ask for help. That wasn't, as, that wasn't as necessary when looking at Eclipse and Falu, but then you have these two, Ezra and USA, who I truly could not tell apart ever. They look very, very similar in my opinion. They have very similar coloration, their shape is similar, uh, their tail shape is similar, and I always had to ask for help when I was looking at the two of them. So take a look, see if you can tell any differences between these two individuals. I certainly couldn't physically but there are some behavioral differences. So every animal has their own personalities, their own personality quirks. One of them was a little bit more shy than the other. One spent more time with their family members. They had a very distinctive family groups, um, two different letters in these names. So that means they have two different mothers. And one of their mothers was really, really distinctive. So I could always tell if she was hanging out with her mom, this is the one individual. And then the other individual hanging out with her group was the other, helping me keep them straight, but also, making sure I asked for help when I needed to, because it can be pretty difficult to tell different animals apart, especially if you haven't been there very long or you're not as used to staring at these animals all day. Of course, after you identify which individual, you still have to find them in the population. So this is a pretty typical example of the group on the move. These are really big social groups. Some of them have up to 50 or 70 individuals. You can see here we have adults, we have juveniles, we have infants. And if you're looking for one individual in that group, that can be pretty tricky, which is another reason it's helpful to have multiple sets of eyes. You can ask the observers or the other research assistants if they've seen a specific individual, they can help point them out. They can also point out in the group where they may have seen them last. These groups get pretty scattered as they're on the move. So if an animal is in the front of the group, a little bit more tricky to find them, which is why you have to have multiple eyes on the scene. It can be really easy then sometimes when they're all sitting in a nice open field, the grass is nice and short. You can see all of the individuals in that group all spread out uh, nice and easy. It's a little bit more tricky to identify them when they're sitting down, but if you're looking for individuals who are really distinctive, like some of the photos we saw earlier, or individuals with a tracking collar on, when they're sitting down in this open field, it can be very nice to tell who is who. On the other hand, you have times where you get to the field and they look like this. There are lots of baboons here in that tall grass, but it can be really, really difficult to see any animals, let alone the specific animal you're looking for. So in times like this, you just have to kind of wait it out. So this is also a nice example of the wet season versus the dry season. So that last photo, that nice green grass everywhere, that is definitely not the case in this photo. So when times are a little bit drier, it can be a little bit more difficult for the baboons to forage in the same way. So that's when they're gonna be in these nice dense outcroppings that would maybe wouldn't be as comfortable for them since they can't see things coming. But you have to do what you have to do when you don't have the food resources that you would in the wet season. Then it comes time to follow the individuals. So if you have an animal you wanna follow throughout the day, that can be a little bit different depending on the research questions you're asking. So if you're looking across lots of different animals, if you're looking at every adult female, for example, you might wanna spend only 15 minutes or so recording the behaviors of those individuals. So you might spend that time following that animal around, and then you might spend longer chunks of time if you're not working with as many individuals. So maybe you're spending up to an hour with one individual. This is a nice example of babies who are a little bit too big to be carried around everywhere, but 
the mom is on the move and the baby just really wants a ride, but he's too big to get carried everywhere. So poor guy couldn't quite climb up all the way before mom started walking. My project was a little bit more flexible in who I was following since I was trying to get photos of lots of different individuals. So when the animals got scared or moved somewhere where I couldn't follow, I could just move around to the group, or to another area of the group and take pictures of whoever was accessible. This is a video of what happens when the animals get scared. They all run to one direction. The camera moves because I was laughing at Chelsea because Chelsea's project was a little bit less flexible. She had to watch one individual for a longer time and stay with her, which meant on days like that, when the animals were on the move, she had to find her way through the mud to continue watching her animal, sometimes with binoculars when they got too far away. And I could just get back in our research vehicle, get back in our car, drive around to the front of the group wherever they settle down and start over with a new female whenever I got to that final spot. Sometimes the animals make your life a little bit more difficult depending on your project. Baboons can climb trees, that's where they spend their night. That's also where they do a lot of their foraging on seed pods or other fruits that may be growing in the trees. You hope they're in a nice open tree like the one on the right and not necessarily those really big dense trees like the one on the left. These trees are wide enough, these trees are broad enough that almost all of the individuals in a group can be up in those trees. So you can see one tree that may have 45 baboons in it, which is a really, really impressive sight, but really difficult when your job is to take pictures of them on the ground. Usually I was lucky that one or two individuals would linger down at the bottom, eating the seed pods that were dropped by their friends up in the trees. And so I could just spend my time with them, taking pictures of whoever was nice enough to linger down on the ground for me. Even when they're down on the ground though, sometimes it can be pretty difficult to follow them depending on what the terrain looks like. So we've seen a lot of photos just of those open grassy savannas, very nice, very easy to walk through. Not the case with these lava rocks here. So sometimes in the rocks, it can be a little bit tricky for us as humans to pick our way through them. Obviously the other animals are pretty comfortable. So you can see a couple giraffe in the back, just able to walk around in these loose rocks. I found it pretty difficult myself. Also, I was carrying a pretty expensive camera. So that made it a little bit more tricky as I'm walking, making sure I don't fall, making sure I definitely don't hurt the camera as I fall. And then you have the picture on the right, which is showing off baboons sort of natural camouflage in those gray, dusty environments. They look really similar to their ground around them. So see if you can count how many baboons you can see in this photo, both under that shade tree in the middle and around the grasses on the outside. Well, now I'm curious. Mm -hmm. mm, 2,000, no, 50, 20. 20, I, I see like nine maybe in the middle there. I'm gonna say nine. What do you think? <laughs> there are 14 baboons somewhere in this uh -huh. photo. I zoomed in and went through it the other day trying to find them all. Um, but there are 14 animals there. So even if you know what your animal looks like, you know who you're gonna follow next, you know where the group is, sometimes you just can't see them. Of course, it's also a lot easier when the animals are moving around. They're not moving in the same way the rocks are, but on a nice hot sunny day like that, they're gonna be finding those shade spots. They're gonna stay there for a little while. So it can be pretty tricky to track them through that. After you find them in the wild, you wanna start recording their behavior. So most days they're in a nice spot. You can do the observations you want. Then you have to figure out how you're gonna ask those questions. So maybe you're interested in a question of what baboons eat or what animals eat in general. Maybe you're looking at these nice pink flowers that are growing at the beginning of the rainy season and wondering to yourself, would a baboon eat these flowers or what animals like to eat those flowers? So instead of following an individual animal for the whole day, maybe you're just gonna watch that spot. Maybe you're just gonna watch those flowers and see if you can answer the question, would an animal eat them? This is a nice young male who is clearly demonstrating that the answer to that question is yes. So those flowers look like a nice delicious food source. You can also see how primate hands are grasping those flowers, pulling them up and eating them the same way that we might eat a nice snack like chips or something with our hands. Mm. 
Maybe you're interested in questions of things like climate change, things like how an animal is adapting to different situations. So you might compare similar behavior of similar aged individuals in a wet season or dry season. So this is a baboon in the dry season here, um, trying to get some bark off of that nice acacia sapling there. You can see those really big thorns he has to contend with, figuring out the different ways to eat around that. The adults will eat the seed pods, the adults will eat the leaves. He hasn't quite figured out what parts of that tree branch are nice and tasty yet, but he sure will by the time he's an adult. Again, you can see those nice grasping hands. You can even see those grasping toes, so wrapped around that branch there, using it to help get that leverage to get those snacks off of it. On the other hand, you have a similar aged baboon in the wet season. So this is the time of the year that there's not lots of grass, lots of nice green things for them to eat. It's really easy for them to forage in the way that it wasn't when it was dry. So they're spending more time resting, they're spending more time playing. They're not as focused as forage at foraging all of the time that they would be in the dry season when it's a little bit more inaccessible for them. So you can compare behaviors that are happening at the same time in different situation. Maybe you're interested in social interactions. So which animals are spending time with who and what those behaviors actually look like. So are they playing? Are they grooming? Are they fighting with one another? This is a nice play session here happening with this sort of wild playground. So you can see these three young baboons. You might be interested in how they're interacting with each other, what social groups they come from, and how far away they are from their mom. So there's one mom coming in the background, coming over to check up on the kiddos playing on this playground. But they're kind of independent. They're off on their own. They're doing their own thing. Mom's not all the way around them all of the time. That's different when you're looking at younger animals. So these are animals who are only a few months old. They're still playing, they're still hopping around, trying to figure out how to walk. They're a little bit less stable when they're this young, but you can see mom is right behind them there in the bushes. So they're just on the other side, but they're staying in nice close distance. If something were to scare them, somebody got too close or something happened to them, mom could just grab them and be on the move with them nice, safely tucked in there. You can also look at which individuals are interacting with each other. So these two babies here are family members. Their parents are probably siblings. I think in this case, it was an aunt and her daughter. Um, but that way they are all interacting with their family members. And that might be a question that you're interested in answering. And when you're looking at who is spending time with who. So after you get done with your research, after you collect all of these nice, interesting data, you have to answer the question but also actually think about what question you were able to answer. So in the example, if you were looking for what baboons eat, maybe you watched a baboon eat different food sources throughout the day. Maybe you did that with lots of individuals, but over the course of a few weeks, did you answer the question, what do baboons eat? Or did you answer the question, what do these specific baboons eat during this specific chunk of time that I was here watching them? So sometimes you're not able to answer the question as fully as you'd want. Um, Lydia Green, who we saw earlier at the Lemur Center, was looking at that question with lemurs this summer. And so she came out in the beginning of the summer to see what the free ranging animals were eating during the springtime when there's lots of flowers, lots of seed buds growing. And then she also tried to answer the question towards the end of the summer. So when there's more fruit, less flowers, but more of those big mature leaves. So figuring out what free ranging animals are eating, but over the course of the entire summer to help more fully answer that question. Sometimes you might need more information. So you might need to come back at the same time the next year or come back in a different season to answer the same question. Maybe you're looking at different individuals at different ages. And other times you need a really long time to help answer those questions. So here are some examples of long running research studies happening with mammals all over the world. So these are mammals that have been studied their whole lives in most cases. People have been out there with them for more than 40 years, more than 50 years in some cases, answering those questions over a really long time. So you can compare the information you're getting now to the information that was collected years and years ago. So lots of researchers coming in, 
these projects are happening longer than the careers of most researchers. So people are coming in and leaving the project. The animals are growing up. The animals are aging themselves. So you can track them for pretty much the entire course of their lives. But that helps us answer those really big questions that maybe you can't answer when you're just out there for a little while. So you can see the Ambicelli Baboon Project is one of those really long, long running research studies. So comparing um, the information that we were able to collect over one summer as research assistants to the decades of research that has been collected by the expert observers who are there all of the time. So that is our final question break. If anybody has any, I'd love to talk a little bit more about research and observational research in the field. Fantastic. Anna, what a cool presentation. Some amazing video. Always uh, a treat to get to see primates in the field in action. So thank you so much for that. Uh, let's dive in. So while we're getting our, our live classes, you guys can rile your kids up and get them ready with some questions. I'm going to take one from YouTube to start because it's a question that I had and I think a lot of classes might have it. So Bernard CS wanted to know, why do they have green dots in their yeah, side? Yeah, those green dots are from my project. So my project used lasers as a scale to help us measure the animals. So asking that question, how big is this animal? When you're out in the field, you can't just take a tape measure to them. So by putting those lasers, those dots on their side, we can use that as a scale. Those dots are four centimeters apart. So when we measure those dots, we can then measure the length of the animal's entire body or maybe their arm or leg length to see who is bigger than the other individual. So maybe that's answering questions about rank or questions about how they're growing. You can use those lasers that way. Very cool. High tech meets field work. I love it. Exactly. Um, you know what? You're going to be able to answer this one really fast too. It's from Miss Duncan's class in Chatham, Ontario. So from Sarah in the class, do they have a litter or one baby? Yep. Usually just one baby. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Super fast answer for you, Ms. Duncan. Um, all right, let's go to Ms. Bergeron's class, Stafford Springs. Come on up, guys, and go for it. How much food do how much food do they eat? Yeah. So that's really hard to answer with the wild animals, right? So the animals that are in human care, we give them a scoop of food, and that's the food they eat throughout the day. We can make sure their weight stays the same so they're eating enough. But it's really difficult to answer that question with wild animals. They're spending pretty much their whole day grazing. They're pretty much their whole day eating. But those can be really small amounts over the course of the entire day. So with those baboons, they're pretty big, but a lot of this time they're spending is eating really small things like the blades of grass that you're seeing or the bases of those grass seeds when they're digging in the ground, even tiny seed pods. So they're eating food pretty much the entire day, but they're eating really small amounts of it. So we can't necessarily measure how much food they're eating. But we can measure how much time they're spending eating that food. Yeah. Nice question to kick us off. Thanks to the student. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Bergeron's class. All right, let's go to Ms. Basalto's uh, back in Miami. Ms. Basalto, come on in and go for it. Hey, yes, my class wants to know after you do the observations and you record their behaviors, if they want to know if you have ever uh, marked one of some of them and if you have continued that observation, uh, keeping track of the one that you have marked. Yeah, so with this project, they all have names, they all have distinctive identities. We can keep track of them for their whole lives. So um, I could look at an individual for a little while, but they can also watch that individual for the entire time that they are with that study group. So in these cases, the females will be born into a group and will stay in that group their whole lives with their moms, with their sisters, with their other female relatives. So we can watch them throughout the entire course of their lives. The males will move groups. So sometimes one animal will move from one study group to another study group. So the project is still going, but sometimes they are just grow up and leave the study group completely. So we might not see them ever again. Sometimes they come back after 10 years or so and join that study group. So we don't know what happens in the meantime, but we can keep track of them throughout the time that they're spending with the group. Yeah, nice questions, guys. All right, so about the time that you were saying that uh, you don't help heal animals in the wild. We got a bunch of questions on sick animals in general, so I'll share them both with you on YouTube. So Tava wanted to know, when baby lemurs get sick, will parents try to heal it? And a follow-up to that from Megan is, what happens if a lemur gets sick at the lemur center? So mothers helping babies, and then in general, in captivity with you guys, do you help them there? We absolutely do at the lemur center, yep. So we have a few full-time vets on staff. They've been there for a long time, so they kind of know what ailments happen with lemurs. Usually when an animal gets sick, the family members sort of react the way you would um, if one of your family members got sick. So you might be curious what's going on. The animals can't really heal themselves. The animals can't really heal each other, um, but they might be really interested in what's happening with that animal that day. And so the 
um, veterinarians can come in, make sure we're taking care of that animal. So we'll take them away from their families if they have to, if they have an injury that another family member might try to poke at or might be curious about, they'll just be kept in a separate enclosure, still able to see and smell each other. And then once they're nice and healthy, we'll be reunited with their families. So lots of vet care is happening at the lemur center. That's a really nice advantage of the animals who are working, who are living in human care. So at zoos or research facilities, they have that nice benefit of food and also the veterinary care that they need to stay nice and healthy. Nice. One thing I'd encourage classes to check up as a follow up to that is when we get sick, we often take things like drugs, we take Tylenol, aspirin, whatever it may be. And in a lot of animals we've observed over the years, primates and cetaceans, so whales and dolphins, uh, the ability that they'll seek out things and materials to help them heal, which is really cool. We're not the only animal that seeks out drugs, so to speak. Uh, so I encourage you guys to check that out. It's a neat follow up. All right, let's go to Mr. Bocci's class. If you guys have another question for us, come on in and go for it. Just de your mic and you're good to go. Hi, um, my class is wondering how do baboons help the environment or do they have an effect on their environment? Yeah. yeah, so every animal is impacting its environment somehow, right? So it's a part of the food chain. Animals may be eating it. It might be eating other animals. Baboons are up in those trees. They're foraging for food and they're helping other animals in their environment like a lot of the gazelle species that you'll see in Kenya. So they're up in the trees getting those seed pods, but there are tons of seed pods. They might be grabbing it, they might be eating one or two seeds out of it, and then just throwing it on the ground because there's so much more food that they could eat. There are lots of gazelles, lots of those deer, antelope type animals who are down at the base of those trees waiting for those primates with their grasping hands to drop food down for them. So they're all working together to get those food sources, but a gazelle can't climb a tree in the same way that the baboons can. So working together, that is also great for predator defense. So you have eyes up high, you can yell if you see something and all the other animals can scatter, can get out of the way from a predator faster than they would be if they were relying on their vision down at the ground. So all these animals working together um, in their environment to make sure that they're getting all of the food that they can possibly get and using all of the resources they have to their advantage. Yeah, that was a very thoughtful answer. One thing I, I want to talk about with predator defense, which I find fascinating, and I'm pretty sure it was in baboons originally, is different alarm calls for different things. So like a leopard alarm call versus a snake versus like a hawk so that they could, uh, you know, react accordingly because of the different threats that those animals face. Is that something that you ever saw or experienced or? Yeah, that's also really, really cool with those observers who are there so long. Those observers know the predator defense calls too. So we have those eyes out there making sure we stay nice and safe. We have vehicles that are really close by in case there's an animal like a predator that we as humans need to get away from. But the animals will make those alarm calls and those observers can tell you like, oh, there's a hyena somewhere that they can see or they can smell. And so we with our binoculars can look out for that hyena or maybe that's a lion, maybe that's a hawk. Sometimes they make a call that we know isn't a threat to us. Like if they see an eagle, obviously that's not gonna be a threat to us as humans. So we can continue doing the research there, but it's really, really cool to see the animals all respond. The animals all look up, the animals all look in a different direction, but even more cool to see the observers tell you exactly what those calls mean. Cool, how neat is that? Makes me wanna to go to Kenya. And when I can, I may. Um, Anna, we're gonna wrap up with one more question from Ms. Adams students. Uh, so come on up guys and uh, go for it. Oh. oh, my dear, could you come a little closer to the camera? Sorry, we couldn't catch that one. Is the boy a girl a guy and do pirates win? Mm, Miss Adams, could you repeat it? I'm sorry. Yeah, is the boy or girl in charge and do primates swim? Perfect, thank you. <laughs> So primates don't like to swim. Humans are a nice exception there, of course, in our summer pools. And at different, different primate species, different animals are in charge. So with lemurs, the ladies are definitely in charge, but the boys and the girls are around the same size. So the females are in charge sort of instinctually. They might be a little bit more mean. They might be bullies sometimes. In baboons, it's the other way. So the males are always in charge of those big groups. The males are also quite a bit bigger than the females. So about two thirds the size of the males of the females the males are. So the males are very big, very bulky. They have very long, sharp teeth. They definitely stay in charge of those groups and they are kind of constantly battling with each other to be in charge of the males too. So lots of nice social interactions happening there. Lots of rank stuff to figure out, um, but all of the males are in charge and then all of the females, they might have a pecking order within themselves too, but they're not more dominant than the males are. 
Yeah. One of the things is a nice follow-up to that. Uh, when we've been doing the live from the lemur forest presentations with Megan, we've seen with ring-tailed lemurs where the females are in charge, how that hierarchy plays out literally live on camera when they're getting mm -hmm. It's very, very cool. Um, so before we wrap up, Anna, I just want to pass along to all our students that are joining live or on YouTube. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Duke Lemur Center, it's an amazing organization. As I said, we've done a bevy of sessions with them over the last few months. So check out lemur.duke.edu on the bottom of your screen. It's an amazing website. they got some cool stuff there. And secondly, I know we were talking about baboons mainly today, but uh, for those students who are really keen and ask lemur questions anyway, October 30th, Lemur Day, uh, we've got five programs happening, so check those out, sign up today. Uh, registration links are all on our website at exploringbytheseat.com, so do check that out. Anna, is there a last message you'd like to share with us about your own experiences in the field, something you want kids to take away today, uh, things that they can do when they go home to keep the learning going? Um, basically just stay really curious. So my early days of observation happened because I like to watch what my cats were doing during the day. So where they were going, how they were spending their time. Uh, you can do that with a fish tank. You can do that in your backyard garden, just looking at the birds who may be coming to the bird feeders or the squirrels who get too close sometimes. So stay curious, stay patient, and make sure you're coming up with cool questions about the world around you. Fantastic, what a great message to wrap up with. Uh, thank you so much for a lovely presentation. What we wanna do at the end, Anna, it's your first time joining us, what we do at the end of every presentation, I'm gonna bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and goodbye to you today. So, Ms. Basalto, Ms. Bergeron, Mr. Baccia, and Ms. Adams, if you could join me in saying a huge thank you to uh, our uh, Anna today. Go for it. Thank you so much, guys.